recorded live at the center of the earth. This is Robots from Tomorrow. Greg, thanks for joining us. Before we get to the interview, just a few little bits of business to go over first. One way we like to keep things fresh on the podcast is to treat each episode like it's our first. And unfortunately for today, that means making the rookie mistake of not noticing my audio was being recorded by my webcam microphone and not the trusty snowball I'm using at the moment. Thankfully, Jose sounds great and my audio is completely serviceable, just sounding like I'm down the hall or something. I will try to do better next time. Also, a few times in the interview, I mentioned a lecture Jose gave, but of course, I forgot to mention where it was given. It was a panel he hosted at this year's Baltimore Comic Con, where he went into greater detail about not only his career, but also the work he had done on the Absolute Swamp Thing collection and the ongoing Corbin Library. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded, but you can check out his From a Colorist's Perspective posts on his Facebook page and get a pretty good idea of what he covered. And finally, this is our last episode of the year. We hope everyone has a safe and happy home stretch of 2023. We will be back in early 2024 with some more episodes and, fingers crossed, maybe a few surprises as well. So stay safe, enjoy those funny books, and stick around for my chat with Jose Villarubia. Today's guest is someone listeners of this show will be familiar with, as his name is mentioned often and in tones of reverence. For almost 30 years, he has worked with such artists as Jay Lee, Jeff Lemire, Gil Sienkiewicz, J.H. Williams III, and Bernie Wrightson to bring color to their art in a way that always enhances, never detracts. No mean feat there. He's also been a teacher, presenter, lecturer of art and illustration at such institutions as Towson University, Johns Hopkins University, the Institute for Contemporary Art in London, and MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art, where he is currently a professor. Two of his most recent projects are his recoloring of the Bernie Wrightson's Swamp Thing run for the recent Absolute Edition, and the second volume of Dark Horse Comics' Richard Corbin Library, which collects Den Neverwhere with his gorgeous restoration work giving it a new life. He's Jose Villarubia, and I'm thrilled to have him on the show to talk about all of that and more. Jose, how are you doing? Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, I literally just said this, but I am thrilled to have you on the show to talk about some of this stuff. Do you consider yourself an artist with a teaching career or a teacher with a commercial art career? I don't know, because we are, any of us wears many hats. It's, ask, it's like asking somebody, do you consider yourself a father or a publicist? <laughs> or do you consider, you know? I, they're not mutually exclusive. I mm -hmm. feel that uh, I've always loved art and I was good at it since I was little. So that's just not just my professional life, it's also my private life. Um, teaching was not anything I ever thought about, but when I was doing my master's, um, I had a scholarship that required that I w was... I would do among other tasks. Uh, I had to be a teaching assistant for some courses, both uh, studio and academics. And that's where I discovered that actually uh, I liked it and I was uh, talented for it. So um, that was many years ago. It was when I was 24 or so. So uh, what's happened with the years is that my career has changed paths many times uh, from different areas of art and different roles in those areas of art. Now, it feels like there's a confluence between what I do professionally and what I teach in college. What areas of art instruction go into building the type of sequential artist you want Micah to produce? I created first a sequential art class at MICA 
uh, that became eventually more and more successful. And we decided to expand our sequential program. And I designed the minor to accommodate the interest in comics and graphic novels, mostly. We had other faculty teach it before who are no longer part of MICA, but uh, for the last few years, I've been working with Carla Speed McNeil, who is not only an amazing creator, but an unbelievably good mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, she's become a great collaborator in the major and the minor. And this fall, we're incorporating uh, Robert Greenberger to teach an advanced class. And we're thrilled to have him because his area of expertise is deep and serious and uh, and he has a lot of teaching experience as well. Mm -hmm. So our goals in our sequential minor is to concentrate on teaching students how to do storytelling. It's all about the storytelling. We already cover a lot of the craft that goes into making comics in our regular classes, mostly in the illustration department. So we have figure drawing, we have uh, perspective, we have uh, different uses of media, we have a class about inking, we have a class about lettering, we have uh, character design, uh, world building, all the ingredients that you would need to draw comics are already offered as separate classes mm -hmm. in the drawing department, graphic design department, painting department, and illustration departments, uh, animation department too. So um, the element that's missing is how do you put that uh, in a page and actually make the images work together sequentially, like they occur in comics and graphic novels. And um, because of that, we give the students a lot of freedom in terms of the style of comics that they do. Uh, in terms of the mediums that they use, whether they want to do uh, by hand, digital or combination, eventually even in the formats, even though we teach them at first traditionally, mm -hmm. that works really well. We keep getting stronger and stronger students every year, but we already had a, a ton of graduates from the program that have gone on to have professional careers and do very well for themselves. I was going to ask what was something your students have taught you, but I already know one specific answer to that. So I'll, I guess I'll rephrase the, the question this way. How did having Jay Lee as one of your students change your life? Jay was never my student. Oh, well, uh, because he, um, you know, I swear I did research for this. Um, I thought that you were teaching in Virginia or something, and he was, okay. No, I'll tell you the story. Jay didn't go to college. Jay went to college for about one semester, and he dropped out and started working at Marvel Comics. Um, about one or two years later, I met him because uh, I, did a sh I curated a show of local comics artist and I live in Baltimore so mm -hmm. uh, he was in Arlington at the time and so that was close enough and he participated in the show he came to the opening I met him we became really good friends and then I started eventually well not that long like within we he left Marvel he started working for Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld and then he was given his opportunity to do his own comic and that's when he asked me to work with him in the meantime, he always says that he considers me his mentor, and that's where the confusion may come from. In the absence mm -hmm. of an education, through our friendship, I expose Jay to things that are important to me that I think he would like as well. So I introduced him to Dino Battaglia. He borrowed a book of his stories uh, that he kept for 10 years. Um, <laughs> And that was a big influence on him. I introduced him to, uh, I think, either I introduced him or we both talk about it at the same time, but uh, Sean Phillips, when he was first working with Paul Jenkins on Hellblazer, uh, and Toppy and all the Italian ones, and, uh, you know, and just art in general. Um, and so um, I was showing fine art photography. I was showing all different kinds of things and and uh and you know glad that 
he was receptive. He's mm. he was stubborn, but he was receptive <laughs> that he liked. Yeah. So, but you know, he already had a special gift uh, from the very beginning. And even though some of those early drawings were very rough, but he, um, if you are used to working with young artists, you can see through the roughness if there's something underneath. And he really, he really developed his style, and he continues to develop his style. So I'm thrilled to see the evolution in his work. Yeah. Uh, where I was going with that was that it, it seemed like he's the one who sort of pulled you into having, if not a career in comics, he had you coloring some of his early work and that kind of got you thinking of that being an avenue for expression or, or whatever. Is that close to accurate? More or less. Okay. Um, close enough. I, already, I had already worked for DC Comics oh. and because I was friends with Greg Reroque and he was a student in one of my classes and he uh, asked me if I wanted to do some work for DC. I said yes and I did some pinups for who is who in the Legion of Superheroes and one of them got published, the other one somebody else had already drawn, so the other character. But then a few months later I received a phone call from an editor at DC who asked me if I wanted to draw a backup story, which I remember to be Green Arrow, but I am not sure if that's uh, what it was. But that's what I think I remember. And I said no, because even though I always wanted to be a comic book artist, I had done an MFA in painting, and I was very happy with my career in fine art mm -hmm. at the moment. So when Jay and I be, became friends, I had completely lost any interest in working in comics uh, as an artist, but I never even considered working in comics as a colorist because coloring was done in a very limited and laborious way that when I got the Marvel tryout book, I did inking. I love doing that. I, lo I did penciling, which I liked, but less. And then... I think I colored one panel and that was it. Mm -hmm. There was no interest whatsoever to do like the coding and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But things were changing. Painted comics had been published already. Uh, both Jay and I really loved them. We like the same things. We like uh, Bill Sienkiewicz painted comics. We like Kent Williams. We like John J. Muth. We love why Lynn Varley had done not so much in Dark Knight Returns, but in uh, Electra Live. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so co coloring for me had gotten interesting because of painted comics. And so Jay didn't want digital coloring that looked like what was being done at the time. He wanted painted colors. And I like painted colors. That interests me. Uh, so we did Hell Shop together. He, he basically hired me. I went back to school and learned Photoshop. And since I was image, we work on that. And it was well received. We did two mini series. The first one I did color guides. The second one I knew Photoshop. So I did full colors. And then Jay decided to go back to Marvel. It took me along with him. But at first, it just didn't happen because Marvel wasn't interested in the kind of work that I did. They wanted more traditional digital coloring. <laughs> But Jay was persistent, and then other artists started asking for me, and then, well, the editor said, well, we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. And that was my beginning of my long association with, with Marvel. Same thing happened with uh, DC Comics. Uh, Jay also brought me along, and he tried in Dark Horse, but they have in-house colorists at the time, so Dark Horse took a little longer. I think that's where I made the conflagration between Jay Lee and Craig LaRoque. Mm -hmm. His flash run is one of my one of my favorites. There's a the splash page from '79. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the end of the Return of Barry Allen, where you see Reverse Flash, and he's got his hand cocked back. He's about to pull his punch. The face that he gave Reverse Flash just it's still like oh, it's very it's a very powerful flash. Okay, so as I mentioned in the intro, your comics career has seen you work with you know some of the best talents in the world today. But one name I didn't mention was Alan Moore. 
I just reread the top shelf release of Mirror of Love last night, which for those who don't know is Moore's epic poem covering gay culture from prehistory to the 1980s and roughly a thousand words, which you illustrated. And it's still a very powerful experience reading it. Before we get more into the comic side, can you talk a little bit about how that collaboration came about and what it was like working on that book? Yeah, that book was really, it wasn't expected for me to do it because what happened is I was familiar with the text of the poem. Uh, it came out in a magazine called Rapid Eye, issue number three. And the opportunity arose for me to get involved in a series of uh, short performance pieces that were done in a local alternative theater. Uh, and um, they had a festival called Queer Cafe, and they were looking for content. And the artistic director of the theater, it's called Theater Project here in Baltimore, which had done tons of prestigious work, told me to, uh, if I wanted to contribute, I told him I didn't really know enough theater to do a contribution. But then I went home, thought about it, and I thought this poem could be adapted into a dramatic monologue. I enlisted my friend David Drake, uh, who is a playwright and theater director, best known for his play, The Night Larry Kramer Kiss Me, which is uh, a very uh, beloved uh, solo work that he did in the 80s. So he specialized in solo performances at the time. He loved the idea. And then through Chris Staros from Top Shelf, we uh, asked permission from Alan to do it. He enthusiastically said yes. And uh, then we went on to adapt it. Uh, we had uh, other people involved in the performance and it was great. Um, so we, I did it for two weeks. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, it was well received. And then I sent a tape to Alan and Melinda. They liked it. And then I thought that was that. But when I was in France, in Angoulême, a friend of mine said, why don't you make The Mirror of Love into a comic? And I said, well, I found out later that it had been a comic. So there was no point of making it into a comic because it already existed as a comic. Mm -hmm. And... uh in terms of making it into a book, I was already working with Alan in another project, which was the first novel, uh, Voice of the Fire. I was doing an illustrated edition of that for Top Shelf. I said, so I'm already working in one project, so I don't really feel comfortable about asking for a second project of, of the same sort, another illustrated book. So I said, so I don't really want to talk about it. But you can ask the editor who's right over there if he's interested and uh, see what he says. Mm -hmm. So he did. He asked Chris. Chris said yes immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we went to see Alan. I did some test images for that. I put them in a black folder and wrapped in a paper that had embedded dried roses and the whole thing smelled of patchouli. And uh, Alan opened the package and looked at the first photograph. And he thought for a moment, and then he started reciting the part of the poem that was the piece. He did that with about, I think I did like seven images, six or seven images. So we had his blessing, and with his blessing, I did the book. It's a book that Alan really likes, and when he's invited to do readings in high schools and local colleges, it's the book that he likes to take with him to read because... Well, he's proud of the work, but he also feels it's important for young people to hear it. Yeah, particularly there's a reading from about 10 years ago uh, in Northampton. It's an hour lecture of him. And after about 10 minutes, he gives a reading of the book to the students. And it's wonderful if people get a chance to have the book and read it, to have that playing in the background and having him give a reading as you're looking at it and seeing your illustrations it's it's a good time to do that um okay i find it not at all surprising that when the pandemic hit and you find yourself with time on your hands your love of comics and your teaching muscles sort of teamed up find expression on your facebook page with the from a colorist perspective series of critiques of uh, comic book reprint coloring uh, did that scratch a particular itch for you it just kind of helped me figure out something that was 
kind of a mystery to me because I have, like everybody else, I be buying reprints of uh, classic comics that I love because I want to have them in book form. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what it was at first. It took me a long time to figure out what something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just look at those and it's like, I don't know why, but this doesn't look right. But I have a lot of the comics that I like, the original comics. They're in really crappy shape because I read them a lot. And mm -hmm. So the cover falling off most of them the more I like them the worse shape they are and I never really did the bagging thing so I think one day I decided to just compare what my comics look like with the reprints and I was blown away by how much this thing we was looking at we were looking at was not the thing that I had remember and no wonder I didn't have the same feeling because the colors were all wrong so once I figured this out I started researching why was the reason for this and when the pandemic hit and I had to cancel all my plans it was a really good time to do that research so from a colorist perspective it wasn't just a rant complaining about modern standards in color publishing it was also an investigation on my part of how things ended this way where did they come from whose responsibility was it whose decision was it what factors were involved, uh, whether it was time, cost, etc., And then many experts who were equally trapped at home started pitching in and sharing invaluable information about how the old comics were colored, what the intentions of the colorists were. Um, the people who do the digital reconstructions also pitched in and talk about what they were asked to do and how they had no choice but doing things in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was fun to say, oh, look how bad this looks, but that was not the main purpose. The main purpose was to um, distribute information about something that had not really been widely addressed and for myself to figure out how this came to be and to also find really good examples of uh, reprints, which... I celebrate in those posts mm -hmm. and uh, who is doing good restorations, which I talk about a lot and which companies pay more attention to those things. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason why I did it. So while we're on that topic, who are the, some of the people who are treating reprints in the way that you think they should be treated? Basically, there's a company is basically anything that is not a big mainstream company is mm -hmm. doing really well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Fanographics does really well. Journal Quarterly is amazing. Sunday Press is great. They've been just absorbed by Fanographics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Abrams, they do wonderful work. Um, IDW has done some really good stuff. Everyone but the big two. So in terms of people, uh, Peter Maresca is my favorite restorer. He did the Big Little Nemo books. And uh, amazing Flash Gordon for Titan in England. Uh, Alan Harvey did an amazing book on the war stories from the 1950s from Atlas. It, it goes, it's called Atlas at War, and it's a fantastic volume. And now he's in charge of doing the Fanographics Atlas Restorations, which Tales of Terror, Venus by Bill Everett, finally, uh, a Joe Manili selection. Those are going to be superb. So those are some of the people that I really look up to and uh, whose work I really admire and some of the companies that do work that uh, I really like and I really enjoy. Uh, Tashin has been doing those mammoth mm -hmm. uh, reprint books that are shot directly from the original printed pages. Uh, uh, the um, Folio Society has done the same, but in a smaller format. Um, those are not so much, they're very slightly restored, but they're more um, aiming to be, in Tashin's case, in large facsimiles. And in the Folio Society, they actually have facsimiles, facsimiles. They have sim single issues of like Action Comics, number one, and things like that. Mm -hmm. They're printed with great care to resemble the original printing. 
in interviews I've heard you give, one response that keeps coming up is uh, that the publisher has the final say about how a book looks, regardless of the artist's original intent, which seems completely obvious, but is something that so many people forget when they are expressing their displeasure about what their quality of the work, either first print or reprints. If you could somehow teach the audience and or fandom one thing to keep in mind when they're looking at a comic, what would that be? Well, it's what you said. I think that the one thing they have to keep in mind is that none of the choices that we, the creative team, make mm -hmm. are necessarily our own. And that applies to writers, to artists, and certainly to colorists and letterers. Uh, we are all under the supervision of the editor and the publisher. So some things you may see something that you like or don't like, and it, we may not have had much to do with it. And that's a point that is missed. For example, I've been nominated for awards for work that I've done that I didn't really choose what I was doing at all. Mm -hmm. So that's just not taken into consideration because unless you know the inner workings of the production of a comic, then you don't know who's saying to do what. So I think that readers don't need to know the details of who decided what, but they should be careful about both praising and blaming uh, creators for decisions because it's not all negatives. This, I mean, as I'm saying, I, mm -hmm. I've gotten very positive feedback for things that I've done that I would have never chosen to do, uh, but they got recognition. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to explain why or right. how or who's made me do that, you know? Yeah. But that uh, comics are American comics are a collaborative medium, but there is a hierarchy in the decision making. It's the publisher, it's the editor, and then it's everybody else. Let's move over to the restoration uh, uh, work that you've been doing. Let's start with Bernie Wrightson. What was the Wrightson work that first made you a fan? And how did you end up getting involved in the recoloring of the Absolute Swamp Thing collection of his run? The first work I saw that I remember seeing by Bernie Wrightson was, I must have been like 13 or 14, and it was um, somebody showed me this uh, indie comic that he did called The Last Hunters, which was in black and white. It was part of Bad Time Stories, and it was reprinted in a Spanish fan scene that I still have. <laughs> and I became an instant fan. I was absolutely blown away. I was talking about John Buscema and how much I loved him, and somebody showed me this, and it's like, oh, yeah, you like Buscema? Check this out. <laughs> And I was really, absolutely, my mind just buckled. And so then I just have to buy everything he ever did, and I did. And then, I mean, years went by, I met Bernie at the same time I met Jay Lee, you know, eventually I colored him and he liked my colors. And then uh, he would always come to the Baltimore Comic Con and his untimely passing was extremely sad. I did a panel with him once where I did a spotlight on him. You know, we like each other mm -hmm. and uh, and he was just amazing. So um, out of the blue, I received a call from the reprint editor at DC Comics who asked me if, if I would be interested in restoring the colors to the, back to the original colors of the original Lin Wein run of Swamp Thing. Uh, I said yes without hesitation. We arranged my page rate, and and I had to do it very fast. <laughs> so mm, that's how it happened. You go into this obviously in depth in, in your lecture on the subject, but what were some of the technical challenges that presented themselves as you were working on this? Um, First of all, DC didn't have good scans of the original art. They would send me scans, but they were just low res and hard to see so the original printed art so i couldn't really examine the colors but i had copies of about half of the series and i had a lot of reprints and i just bought original copies of all of them so that was a challenge uh, and an investment then i was lucky that the most expensive one which is the house of secrets origin i already bought because i found a copy in spain many years ago because that's that can cost you a pretty penny even in crappy shape uh. Then the second challenge was that the line art that they provided was bad. There were some pages that looked good, but others that looked bad. 
and they didn't really have the staffing or means to get all the original art that has been uh, discovered since since the line art was prepared for these in the 80s. They scanned some pages, but not all of them. And there were some that they just didn't find. So I had to research where to get line art that was in presentable condition in many cases, which included the Batman issue. I had to get uh, scans from a French edition that had much better quality than what DC sent me, which was pitiful. Mm. So that was hard uh, and time consuming. <clears throat> so that was the second challenge. And the third challenge was just the timing. I had to do it insanely fast. And so uh, I had to buy a special light so I could actually examine the newsprint very closely to see what the colors were because they're faded and the paper is brown. So with just regular room light, I couldn't really see exactly what was going on in those in those panels. So that that's those were the three challenges. That's a lot. One of the things that, that jumps out sort of overall, and this will obviously come up a bit when we talk about Corbin, uh, is how many sort of variables go into printing something at least once, let alone having to reprint the work later on. From the way the art is shot or scans, to printing technology available, to creative decisions about the presentation, to actually printing, even if everything goes according to plan, let alone you know printing errors. How frustrating is it to have an editor's nostalgia for a previous version you know wasn't what the creator intended? And have you ever been able to convince one of those editors that you were right about what your intention with the recoloring is versus like what they sort of commissioned you to, to do? Does that make sense? Yeah, I've never, I have never done uh, the kind of recoloring I don't like. So I never had to convince anybody because I never was asked to do recoloring I don't like. Uh -huh. I have convinced an editor uh, that I'm not going to name from one of the companies that could be doing it uh, to do a classic run of a very beloved comic. Uh, and they were completely supportive. Um, they were a group editor. But the higher ups in that case said, Nope, because we don't want to spend a penny on this and we're just going to rebound what we did before. So, yeah, with editors, I can certainly have the conversation. Editors are not the ones that make those decisions. It's the budgeting and marketing people that make the decisions about whether something should be done in a certain way to keep in line with everything else that's been done before or just simply recycling color separations that are already available to them which is weird because you would think marketing people would be like hey this is a way to get this material out you know again and like there's a new selling point right it's been it's been recolored but it doesn't always now, you would have to you have to assume that the marketing people would actually be able to tell the difference literally yeah, yeah. okay moving on to corbin obviously He's one of the truly original comic artists of the 20th century. His work looks like nobody else's before, since Dan was clearly a project that he loved the most. What Corbin work was the one that made you a fan of his? My earliest exposure to Corbin was through the Spanish reprints of his stories in Warren comics. Mm -hmm. I would look through the reprints and uh, immediately buy them if they had Corbin in them. In many cases, I would rip out the Corbin pages and throw out the magazine. <laughs> and that was my first exposure. Pretty soon after, I got the Spanish trade paperback of then. And then once I moved to the, in this country, I moved in 1980 to this country uh, when I was 18. And then I started to order his underground comics, uh, anything I didn't have. Uh, during the 80s, Corbin was very well served by Spanish publishing because his agent, uh, Josep Tutain, he really did a lot to promote Corbin's work in Europe in mm -hmm. particular, and eventually opened an American branch and did Catalan communications. Um, mm -hmm. So his work collected was very easily available uh, during the 80s, including some of the underground in in an anthology for Warren. And then basically, you know, since I was here, I could have access to 
everything and I bought everything. everything. Mm. So now that Dark Horse is doing the Richard Corbin Library, collecting a lot of his work from various places, how did you get involved with that project? Well, from the very, 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 very beginning, you know, I had worked with Corbin several times. Sometimes he would ask me for advice about technical stuff having to do with colors and digital stuff. And then we would do work periodically. I bought artwork from him. He gave me artwork. I mean, you know, we had a really good relationship. Mm -hmm. When he unexpectedly passed away, um, one of the early conversations I had with the widow was that his classic work needed to be back in print. And so uh, the idea of the corporate library was something that the widow knew she wanted and she had my full support. So I helped her um, in every aspect I could, including negotiating uh, a deal with the publisher to get this thing done. So I've been involved with it from its inception, you could say. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that even though it's never been done before by this publisher or by most any other publisher, other than the Creepy Presents Richard Corbin, which I had done 10 years ago, uh, which I used as many originals as I could, mm -hmm. this was going to be done as much as possible from original art. And I didn't find too much resistance to that. And I knew that Corbin had never sold the originals to then. So uh, Donna could scan all the original pages of that series. Uh, which he did, and, uh, and it's happening. I'm trying to remember, when you lectured on this, it seemed like the amount of detective work and looking at different printings and trying to come up with a cohesive look for that, it seemed like, honestly, a Herculean process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so Corbin developed a coloring method in which he actually hand drew the color separations, which is something that nobody had done before or after. So he hand painted the color separations, meaning the cyan, the yellow, and the blue in films using uh, several layers of like a combination of airbrush and dyes. Um, it's a method that started more or less simple and became more complicated as the year went by and eventually became extremely complex. All that film has been lost. There's a few remaining copies of some of the color film from some of the Warren stories that has been auctioned. But basically, to reconstruct the color that he did, you had to look at the printed page and extract the color from the printed page. Um, and when Creepy came out, I already knew that there were a lot of printing errors that were due to the technology of the time and also his unusual method. So sometimes areas would get oversaturated. Uh, sometimes there was a little bit of registration problems and stuff. I have several editions of almost everything he's done, so I can compare them. But volume one wasn't so hard. Volume two, the Catalan edition, the Tutain edition, I thought was the way he meant it. And Donna and Corbin's daughter, Beth, who was his colorist, told me that there was something wrong, but they couldn't put their finger in what was wrong, but the colors seemed wrong. Eventually, I figure out that the one that has been internationally distributed is just simply too light, and the color is shifted. So I look at all of the original printings of that story in heavy metal, because I have the first 100 issues of heavy metal, mm -hmm. and I uh, reconstructed the color based on the heavy metal printings but better because the heavy metal printed them a little dark sometimes and a little shifted sometimes or a little fuzzy so uh, volume three was a challenge because the artwork had been sold so then we had to track down collectors all over europe and the states fortunately i have about 20 of the pages of that and then with a lot of help from co some collectors in france and uh around uh, from Delirium, the editor from Delirium, we were able to put together a collection of originals so I could do that. Uh, volume 5, I'm wrapping up right now and 
Donna has all the art. When you have artists like Corbin or Wrightson, where there's such a, a solid fan base in the original art collectors from sort of scene, how much does that help when you're trying to track down some of these pages? Can you talk to one of them and the, like they know like maybe who has this other page? Does that sort of networking help in that regard or? Yes, uh, more with Corbin than with Wrightson, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't track some of the people. Uh, with Wrightson, there are a lot more unknowns, and I think that may, some of those pages may have been lost, actually. Um, so, yeah, there's a network of collectors that specialize in certain artists, and they know each other because oftentimes they compete with each other. Mm -hmm. I had the really good fortune to uh, meet uh, Guillermo del Toro, whom I met through Santiago Segura, who is a Spanish, a very wonderful, celebrated uh, film director in Spain who's friends with Guillermo and uh, both of them are avid uh, Corbin collectors and uh, Santiago showed me his collection and I had seen a lot of it in Angoulême because he lent his work to Angoulême and Guillermo had put uh, a selection of his collection at the LACMA show in Los Angeles. They are fully on board with this and they are two of the most important collectors of Corbin work. Uh, particularly because they have very selected, important kind of key pieces in his career. The, the Del Toro thing always makes me laugh because I remember one of the Criterion editions of his work, he gives a tour of either his house or his, his like walk-in museum, and he was talking about a Corbin piece. And I think it's the piece that they use for the Dark Horse cover of the creepy collected Corbin, where it's the lady ghoul who is very voluptuous or whatever, but then her face is this weird skull half thing. And he bought the piece and like he loves it and it's it's a fantastic piece but his wife was like yeah not in the kitchen like that can't be yeah. in the house you know and he's like so here it is you have to be very particular about where you put it in your home or, or whatever i oh you did you did that or be single well yeah, <laughs> but that that as well um i remember hearing you talk about corbin was when he was doing his color, the amount of layering and the amount of the, the intensity that sort of he was working at and some of his color choices. Can you talk a little bit more about like how, how unique he was in that? Yes. Um, the most unique aspect of it beyond the technical is that he could visualize what the page would look like printed just in his head. Mm -hmm. So he would do very sophisticated and very original color combinations by working on the primary colors uh, directly by saying this much magenta, this much cyan, and this much yellow, period. And so that's the visualization part is the one that is astonishing that he could actually think about it in his mind. I've only seen a couple well, preliminaries for colors for a couple of things that he did. But if he did any more, they haven't been preserved. The other thing is that because working directly on the plates, he could do things that normal color separations couldn't do, like have a 100% amount of each one of the colors. However, from John Workman, I saw a color separation from uh, New Tales from the Arabian Nights. And... Those color separations that we're using printing are not exact replicas of what he did by hand, meaning they are photographed in a way that the ink limits are much lower than the ink limits for each one of the colors would have been with the colors that he put in the hand-drawn separations. So as we wrap things up, I wanted to ask you about Baltimore. Listeners know that I live in Baltimore for like the last couple of years. You could teach anywhere, you could live anywhere. What is it about Baltimore that keeps you here? Well, uh, I love Baltimore. <laughs> Simple enough. <laughs> uh, I think Baltimore is very underrated among American cities. And I think that people think that if you live in Baltimore, you're like in an episode of The Wire. <laughs> and that's just not true. The wire is very well done, mm -hmm. and it's certainly true to what happens in some parts of Baltimore in certain circumstances. But it's a you know it's a drama, and so 
everybody's life is not a drama every day mm -hmm. it's very normal life is boring or exciting but not drama like that because that's television mm -hmm. so i feel that baltimore is like a well-kept secret it's full of history so people in baltimore are the nicest people um i always say you cannot be pretentious and live in baltimore <laughs> nope because Baltimore doesn't have that kind of cachet. So you go to New York, you go to Washington, D.C., you go to L.A., you go to San Francisco, and you can find people that are like, why the hell do you live in Baltimore? Mm -hmm. You won't have people like that here. Yeah. So I think that the other thing is I have a job that I love. I've been a professor for 20-some years now, mm -hmm. and I used to teach at Towson State before that, and I love that job too. Mm -hmm. I uh, I live in a big apartment, which is affordable. Uh, it's a building that is from 1875 uh, with like all fireplaces, as you can see behind me. Mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful, has a beautiful balcony, faces the square. It's a gorgeous place to live. Mm -hmm. um, it's walking distance from school. I don't drive. That helps. 10 minutes from the train station, uh, which I used to go to New York and Washington all mm -hmm. the time. And it's a quick 20 minute ride to the airport if I want to go anywhere else in the world. So yeah, it's perfect. I'm going to take that answer and I'm going to use it whenever anybody asks me why I live in Baltimore. That pretty much covers everything. Um, do you have anything coming up that you can talk about? I have a big project coming from Marvel, but it hasn't been announced yet. Okay. It's a sequel to something I did years ago that I'm very proud of with a major character. Um, I'm doing a series for Comixology with my friend Pablo Raimondi, but it hasn't Ooh. been announced yet. Uh, a mystery horror thing. Uh, it's going to be Comixology and then Dark Horse. I am doing something very exciting. Huge project with uh, Kelly Jones and famous writer that I can talk about, horror, classic, classic, classic horror. I, I co-wrote an indie graphic novel that is a biography that uh, I'm doing with a French artist and this writer friend of mine that it's ready to get started, but I can't announce it yet. <laughs> and... Um, and I've been approached about a couple of really massive uh, comics projects for colors. Mm -hmm. That I'm doing something with the late Tim Sale, uh, wow. bringing back to life one of his most personal projects, and something else that I can talk about. <laughs> uh, but there's a that's a lot. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I wish I could talk about them. It's just like the last interview I did. Once I start, I mean, I had, I, I'm doing another project for Image that I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, unless they're solicited. Yeah, you can't say anything. I can just give hints, I guess, yeah. uh, without getting in trouble. But Which we uh, don't want, yeah. Uh, and then there's some things like, I'm so, you know, I started working on this major project for DC uh four years ago and i completed one issue that was double size and then i've been waiting it hasn't been canceled but i haven't i haven't done any more pages for that so mm. i don't know uh sometimes things happen like that oh yeah and that happened with uh i'm doing this thing for 2018 with uh peter milligan oh. that i can talk about because it was announced finally yes uh, peter and then Rufus Dayglow are doing oh. this amazing comic strip about uh, immigration. Yes. So it's very topical. It's completely uh, outrageous. I'm a huge Milligan fan, and I only worked with Rufus once, and I wanted to work with him again because I was not as happy with my work as I could have been mm -hmm. the first time around. Well, this series, we started, I think, three years ago, and then I thought it had been canceled, but it wasn't. It was just circumstances led to a long hiatus, mm -hmm. and now it's being wrapped up. So it's coming out, I think, in a month, and uh, it's crazy great stuff. 
and I'm thrilled to be working for 2000 AD again, since I did one job with my friend David Roach, who is an amazing comics writer, big mm -hmm. influence on me, and an exquisite illustrator. So, yes. And then I'm working on a project that is an illustrated book that I'm super excited about that I can't talk about either. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I have a few... Okay. Yeah, things in the a few different plates spinning. Uh, you also teach, you know, so there's so yeah. there's that <laughs> that other that other thing to work on. Um, yeah, we love 2000 AD here. It's called Devil's Devil's Railroad. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up to remind me. One other really quick 2000 AD thing that I had in my notes here in terms of restorations or recolorings. One of the ones I thought they did a really good job on was the Ballad of Halo Jones the Alan Moore story. They had originally collected it in black and white because it was done when the uh, the frogs were, you know, mostly black and white with like a color spread maybe. Um, but then, but uh, Barbara Nascenzo, I thought did a wonderful, wonderful job on the, not even recoloring because. No, it's coloring. Yeah, it's coloring. I feel like she looked, you know, she sort of absorbed what the coloring of the time would have been it's colorful but still muted enough to not be absolutely in your face so um if you have not had a chance to check that out uh I have, no, i'm looking at it right now it looks really good i mean i have the original you know trade paperbacks mm -hmm. um but that work obviously even though it was drawn for black and white mm -hmm. it didn't have grays or anything so it's very appropriate for coloring and i'm sure that um i imagine that it was supervised by ian gibson and i guess alan approved it because his name is in it yeah yep for some reason he, the fact there's a lot of shading in the black and white sometimes i found that can somehow maybe sort of be a barrier in, in some of these things, at least for me personally, it's like my eye doesn't know quite what it takes a second for my eye to sort of figure out kind of what's going on with the line work. Obviously, it hasn't kept me from enjoying the series, but to have it now in an edition that is also colored and colored so well, uh, it's not double dipping. You're like, it is a companion edition to the original. And of course, it's it's Halo Jones. Like, I, I want to like hand this thing out to everybody I can. And now all the people are like, I don't like black and white. I'm like, oh yeah, well here, here it's in color. Uh -huh. Now you have no excuse. Just read it and have some tissues handy because it can be a bit of a tearjerker. Um, yeah, that's, that's so great. I think I've taken up enough of your Sunday asking you these questions about comics and, and, and teaching and, and, and all of that stuff. Jose, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Um, I look forward to giving a chance to talk again when one of those many projects actually gets to a point where you can read and talk about it. My pleasure.